let me see if I get this right. We, we need to borrow $10 billion from China, and then we give it to Musharraf, who's a military dictator who overthrew an elected government, and then we go to war, we lose all these lives, promoting democracy. Thank you very much. Um, my take home message from today is that uh, my family uh, and others who have lived their entire lives in Iraq don't know what's going on because it's chaos, there's no law, there's no order, it's anarchy. So for anyone to be sitting here 7,000 miles away, we can't know what's going on there. So I, cannot, I don't have time to address all of Dr. Pillar's points, but I do want to comment on his comment that the Shia owe the U.S. a thanks for the overthrow of Saddam. Uh, let's keep in mind that in 1991, it was the American administration who encouraged the Shiite to rise up against Saddam Hussein. We said, we will back you up. And then they were nowhere to be found, and 10,000 Shia were massacred. Let's keep in mind that Saddam was put in power. He was a CIA agent, and his killing sprees started when the CIA was feeding him names of leftists, intellectuals, and communists to eliminate. And let's keep in mind that sanctions imposed primarily by the United States and Great Britain strengthened his rule. So the point there is Iraqis have taken, they've had just about all the help they can take from America. I speak to you today on behalf of relatives on my mother's side, Ashkenazi Jews who fled their homeland of Austria during Hitler's Anschluss. It is for them that we say never again. I speak to you today on behalf of relatives on my father's side who are not living but dying under the occupation of this administration's deadly foray in Iraq. From the lack of security, to the lack of basic supplies, to the lack of electricity, to the lack of potable water, to the lack of jobs, to the lack of reconstruction, to the lack of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they are much worse off now than before we invaded. Never again should apply to them, too. On my first day in Basra, December 25, 2005, my family's house lost electricity. On the second day, we lost water. On the third day, we lost telephone service. One cousin said, I think tomorrow we won't have air. He was joking, but with the hundreds to thousands of tons of depleted uranium that continue to fall on Iraq as I speak, every breath is tainted. Yeah. Depleted uranium is the most likely etiology for the 600% increase in Iraq's infant mortality rate and 300% increase in pediatric leukemias and lymphomas after 1991. It is also the most likely cause of Gulf War syndrome. During the 42 days of the 1991 Gulf War, electricity power stations, telecommunication centers, and sewage treatment plants were destroyed. Their repair or replacement was impeded by economic sanctions. To this day, 15 years later, water from the tap is contaminated, as I accidentally proved during my stay. Families have to buy their water from special stations. For families who can afford it, bottled water is better for drinking, which provides economic gain to Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. Between my visits in 2004 and 2006, there has been no reconstruction in Basra. Bombed buildings remain a constant reminder of our aerial campaigns. One cousin taught at a primary school that was bombed during shock and awe. To this day, the structure is damaged and unusable. Streets are filled with garbage and sewage, undrivable because of bombing damage and general disrepair. New traffic lights were installed while I was there, but due to limited electricity, they're non-functional. Hospitals throughout Iraq were crippled by sanctions as well and have been unable to recover. Epidural anesthesia for child labor or disc disease is simply not available. One of the main hospitals in Basra could not do operations for a week because there was no gauze. That hospital was still standing, however, unlike in Fallujah. And the segments of the population who suffer the most whenever there is no law and order are women and children. They are the most susceptible to traumas of violence and kidnapping. Before the invasion, my cousin at age 18 traveled around Basra independently. Today, it is unsafe for her to go out without being accompanied by a man. As scores of Iraqis die every day, it does not matter if you call it civil war, sectarian strife, or democracy. It is, by design, an American killing field, a smokescreen for stealing oil. It is families, Iraqi and American, who are paying the highest price for the disaster of U.S. foreign policy. This Congress has appropriated hundreds of billions of dollars for our illegal occupation, but the money isn't being spent on armoring military vehicles, and it's not going towards helping returning veterans, whose health care budget came up $1 billion short in 2005. Under Paul Bremer's regime in Iraq, $9 billion went missing. $9 billion. Could we have used the money here at home? 
we should ask the people of New Orleans, a city that was 70% black, now scattered across the country. And while Louisiana and Mississippi were gasping for air, 6,800 members of their National Guard were in Iraq as part of a military force inflicting the same death and destruction as Katrina on the civilian population there. In September 2001, with the exception of Barbara Lee, Congress gave a blank check for war to the decider, who has access to chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. We are the ones using white phosphorus. We are the ones using napalm and its derivatives. And we are the ones using depleted uranium. This is not a war on terror. This is a war of terror. Your obligation to the people of Iraq, to the people of America, and to the rest of the world is the immediate, unconditional withdrawal of American troops and mercenaries from Iraq. In the words of Hassan Juma'a Awad, president of the Basra Oil Workers Union, we as a union call for, for the withdrawal of foreign occupation forces and their military bases. We don't want a timetable. This is a stalling tactic. We will solve our own problems. We are Iraqis. We know our country and we can take care of ourselves. We have the means, the skills, and resources to rebuild and create our own democratic society. Bring the troops home. Make it your number one priority as if lives depended on it, because it does. Bring them home now. Thank you.